Welcome back. My name is Andrew Savage and I am the Executive Vice President of the Tikva Fund. I'm delighted to be able to now introduce one of America's preeminent Jewish leaders and intellectuals as our final speaker, Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik. Rabbi Soloveitchik is surely one of the most interesting voices in the Jewish world. His teaching and ideas on Jewish history and philosophy, on Zionism and Israel, on religious liberty and American civilization have educated and inspired so many people of so many backgrounds religious and secular, young and old, Jewish and Christian. His blend of intellectual depth and oratory talent are truly unique. For those of you familiar with Rabbi Soloveitchik's work with Tikva, you may have been one of the many thousands who have enjoyed live streaming recent multi-part lecture series on the entire Hebrew Bible or his current Jewish Political Greatness series that looks at the most interesting and important Jewish political leaders of the last two millennia. Or you may have enrolled in his Jewish Ideas and American Founders series in Tikva's online library of courses. Rabbi Soloveitchik is the rabbi of Congregation Sheirith Israel in New York, the oldest synagogue in the United States. He is the director of the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought at Yeshiva University, and he is a regular columnist at Commentary Magazine. It is my great pleasure to welcome Rabbi Soloveitchik to take the stage this morning. Thank you so much, Rabbi Savage. Before I begin, I want to express my gratitude to two friends who are so very dear to me. First, to Roger Hertog, one of the wisest men I know, for the blessing of his guidance and encouragement. And second, to Eric Cohn, for his vision and for the privilege of my being able to be part of what he is seeking to achieve in the Tikva Fund. On Yom Kippur, 1946, a young boy in Jerusalem by the name of Moshe Karavani made his way to the Kotel, the Wailing Wall. He was about to play a part in a seemingly small story, today largely unknown, which would symbolically capture the theological and political significance of Jerusalem and the miracle that is the Jewish people. Let us set the scene. Yom Kippur comes to a close all around the world with the sounding of the shofar. But in 1932, in response to Arab demands, the British in Mandate Palestine had issued an edict stating that, quote, Jews are forbidden from blowing their shofar at the wall, end quote. And every year, the underground Irgun movement would smuggle shofars into what was then the small alley at the wall where Jews would pray. And they would recruit young boys, teenagers, to blow the shofar at the holiday's close. In 1946, the Irgun tasked three young men with this mission, Ephraim Steinberg, Shmuel Bahayo, and Moshe Karavani. The respective backgrounds of the three was perhaps unintended, but it did end up capturing the diversity and unity of the Jewish people. Steinberg was Ashkenazi, Baha'i Sephardic, and Moshe was a Yemenite. And indeed, several of the boys' chauffeurs, which were provided by Moshe, had belonged to his father, who had brought them with him as he made his way by foot from Yemen to Jerusalem. Caravani and the others stood among the worshipers at the wall as the sun set and the final verses of the liturgy were reverently recited. Hear, O Israel, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And then the signal. The boys put horns to lips and blew. The British soldiers pounced. Bahayo and Steinberg managed to escape, but Moshe Caravani was emotionally bound up in the moment. As he later recalled, quote, the British jumped from the wall and began hitting people on the head with the long magazines of their Tommy guns. I was full of enthusiasm. I continued blowing all kinds of chauffeur blasts. I knew the correct order of the blast, tkiya, shvarim, trua. I did not care about anything, he said. It did not occur to me to stop until a sergeant or an officer caught me by the shirt from behind. And thus, one of the mightiest empires in human history imprisoned a young boy a teenager, and tried him before a court in Jerusalem for the crime of blowing a chauffeur on Yom Kippur. 
Eliel Merador, who effectively served as the Irgun's attorney, sought to keep Moshe out of prison. And, according to the book The Western Wall Wars, he presented the British judge at Moshe's trial with, it, with one audacious argument among several others. This being that, though it was for, quote, though it was forbidden to blow the shofar at the Western Wall, the, sh the prosecution had not brought any evidence that Caravani was a Jew. And this point had not even been mentioned, end quote. And the judge, in a moment of mercy, on Moshe accepted the argument. It is, ladies and gentlemen, incredible. One has to admire the chutzpah, the Jewish legal ingenuity. How do you know he's Jewish? He's just a guy named Moshe blowing a shofar at the Western Wall at the end of Yom Kippur. Who says he's Jewish? That could be anybody. But in fact, the argument and the judicial decision though they seem amusing, actually reflect a painful poetic symbolism. Because in the end, that is precisely what the British policy at the wall sought to do, to de-Judaize it, to prevent that sacred city from serving as a symbol, an eternal symbol, of living Judaism. Menachem Begin, in his book, Which Changed My Life, his memoir, The Revolt, wrote the following, and I'll quote it from my own cherished copy that was autographed by Menachem Begin. He wrote, The dispute over the Wailing Wall in the Old City is probably a reflection of the whole struggle for the ownership of Eretz Israel. These stones, he continued, are not silent. They do not cry out. They whisper. They speak softly of the house that once stood here, of kings who knelt here once in prayer, of prophets and seers who here declaim their message, of heroes who fell here dying, and of how the great flame, at once destructive and illuminating, was here kindled. This, writes Begin, this was the house and this the country, which with its seers and kings and fighters was ours before the British were a nation. The testimony of these stones sending out their light across the generations. This terrible paradox regarding Jerusalem is that despite the testimony of these stones serving as the foundation of civilization itself, it is just this very whisper, the Jewishness of this city, that empire after empire sought to silence. And we must understand why. To see living Judaism in Jerusalem, to see a very young Jewish boy belonging to a very old people, sounding one of the most ancient instruments in the world at the Wailing Wall, is to be forced to confront what has long been for many an uncomfortable truth, that the Jews are unlike any other nation. Jerusalem, as Norman Parharitz once put it, reflects the scandal of Jewish particularity meaning that the uniqueness of one city in the history of the world testifies to the enduring nature of one people on this earth. Jerusalem proclaims the mystery of Jewish eternity, how it was through one particular people that biblical monotheism was brought to the world. And when we think about it, ladies and gentlemen, we realize that the shofar is for the ear what Jerusalem is to the eye. It too resounds with the scandal of Jewish particularity. For consider, the medieval sage Sadia Gaon explains that the shofar is always meant to recall the sound of Sinai, where the world was given the Ten Commandments, but through the one tiny people that surrounded that site. And a thousand years later, the writer Cynthia Ozick referenced the shofar in a magnificent metaphor, warning assimilated, Jew, warning assimilated American Jews that it is only as Jews that we can truly impact humanity. She wrote, if we blow into the narrow end of the shofar, we will be heard far. But if we choose to be mankind rather than Jewish and blow into the wide part, we will not be heard at all. Both Jerusalem and the shofar reflect Jewish particularity, a small eternal people with a universal message. But for centuries, the response to this was fear and hatred rather than awe. Franz Rosenzweig once reflected that, quote, the peoples of the world foresee a time 
when their land with its rivers and mountains still lies under heaven as it does today, but other people dwell there, when their language is entombed in books and their laws and customs have lost their living power. We alone, Rosenzweig wrote, we Jews cannot imagine such a time. For many peoples this truth could not be born, and thus, for them, the scandal of Jewish particularity had to be attacked and undone. Thus, in the midst of the litigious ingenuity of His Majesty's government versus Moshe Karavani, there was a terrible summation of all that many empires had sought for so long. The chauffeur blower would be released as long as he was willing to renounce the very Jewishness of the moment and the Jewish link to Jerusalem that it proclaimed, as long as the British could still control Jerusalem and enforce the claim of other faiths, first and foremost, to that city. But soon after Moshe Karavani's release in 1946, soon, thanks in no small part to the efforts of the Irgun, the British were forced to leave the Holy Land. And what followed only served to reify Jewish particularity, the mystery of Jewish eternity. An American president, Harry Truman, overrode his Secretary of State to accept the UN partition plan in no small part because of his friendship with a Jewish haberdasher from Missouri from decades before. Stalin took a brief break from his genocidal plans for the Jews in order to support the partition plan, seeking to hurt the British, not to help the Jews. What followed then was a military victory by the Israelis, by the few over the many, expanding Israeli territory beyond the partition plan itself, making Jerusalem its capital, a city for the Jews ending only at the gates of the old city itself. And yet, even in the midst of these wondrous events, many statesmen still believed that as long as Jerusalem could be de-Judaized, then the scandal of Jewish particularity could be denied. John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower Secretary of State, a very religious man, extremely biblically literate, did all he could to internationalize Jerusalem, to install in the city a government by what he called the world religious community. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, that in 1967, the minutes of the Israeli cabinet meetings reveal that most ministers were opposed, even after the Jordanian attack, to taking the old city, arguing that the world would not accept Jewish rule over it. Only two in the unity government, Yigal Alon and Menachem Begin, urged Israel to seize the moment. Historians describe how the paratroopers, expecting a terrible battle once they broke through the gates, discovered a city largely abandoned by the Jordanians. God himself had seemingly made way for the Jewish reunion with the wall and with the mount. One of the paratroopers that was there, Hanan Porat, recalled that, quote, it was a feeling which I cannot really describe in words, a sense of being part of history in the making. No, he continued, even more of that, a sense that we were in the middle of writing a new chapter in the Bible. As we reached the Kotel, he recounts, the paratrooper next to me had grown up in an ultra-secular kibbutz. He too leaned against the Kotel and was sobbing. With a voice choked with tears, he turned to me and cried, Hanan, what should I say? I cried back, say a prayer. But I don't know how to pray, he cried. So say the Shema, I called back. But I don't know how, he screamed. So say it with me, I said. Fighting back tears, I began, Shema. And he, at the top of his lungs, repeated, Shema. Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. The shofar once blown by Karavani in Jewish defiance, was now sounded in Jewish joy. And three soldiers, again one Ashkenazi, one Sephardi, and one Yemenite, were joined in a famous photograph. And despite the debates of the decades that followed, this image still has a hold on the imagination of Jews around the world because so many remember what they felt at that instant, and deep down they dearly desire to feel it again. But as the wonder of the moment has now waned for many, another miracle has presented itself. Since 1967, in the face of Western civilization abandoning its biblical heritage, there are today millions of Christians around the world who have not only come to terms with the Jewishness of Jerusalem, but have made supporting Jewish Jerusalem the foundation of their own faith so that the scandal of Jewish particularity has become the wonder of Jewish particularity. 
This phenomenon was eloquently described by my friend Eric Cohn in his magnificent mosaic essay, The Message for Jerusalem. As Eric writes, quote, to halt the dangerous decline into post-Christian chaos, many Christians have concluded that they need to recover a certain pre-Christian understanding of human life and human nature. That is, they need to return morally, spiritually, politically to the Hebrew Bible and through it especially to the message of the city of Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of old and no less the Jerusalem and the Israel that now miraculously live again. This is why, Eric added, at any gathering of religious Christians in America today, the loudest applause is often reserved for causes and events related to Zion, for the moving of the American embassy to Jerusalem, for formal U.S. recognition of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. For me, one of the most astonishing examples of what Eric eloquently describes can be found outside the United States, in South America. This came to my attention when I was sitting around a year and a half ago in a Jerusalem hotel one morning. Now, as many of you know, if you've traveled to Israel, that as the sun rises over the sacred city, Jewish visitors to Jerusalem in hotels turn their attention to one of the most central of Judaic concerns, breakfast. My mind as well was on critical questions, such as whether there was a line at the omelet station, or how to get the attention of a waiter to get me another latte, or whether there were enough options at the smoked fish table. And so it was distractedly that I perused the Jerusalem Post given out to guests. My eyes nonchalantly fell on a story about a South American leader who had announced that he would follow the example of the United States and move his country's embassy to Jerusalem. This, I saw, was the reason that he gave in the article. Quote, It is only symbolic, but it is worth a lot to those who believe in God. I froze in the midst of my meal. Eternity had intruded upon temporality, however a very tasty temporality it was. What could this man mean? An embassy is a political establishment. It's a matter of diplomacy. How could it serve as a foundation for faith? Yet it is true. A recognition of Jewish Jerusalem is seen by Christians around the world as a bulwark against contemporary assaults on biblical faith. As Eric writes, the improbable Jewish story, the resurrection of Jerusalem, provides perhaps the most compelling grounds for believing that good in the end will ultimately triumph. The Jews, he writes, are the divine message in the, in the bottle. In today's Jerusalem reborn, as so many Christians bear inspired witness, the Hebraic vision of the commanded life has now transformed the revivified Holy Land into the moral capital of the West, which is wh also why, he concluded, why the enemies of Judeo-Christian civilization now target Israel as enemy number one. This is exactly right. And that is why many years after the reunification of Jerusalem, it is those who disdain the Hebraic heritage that also disdain all that Jewish Jerusalem represents. Now, as now today, as you know from this conference, it is not Christian secretaries of state who seek to silence the eternal chauffeur in Jerusalem. It is rather the purveyors of secular culture who desire to efface Jerusalem's Jewishness, to deny the phenomenon of Jewish particularity. This was brought home to me by a recent article in the New York Times by its architecture critic, Michael Kimmelman. The subject of the piece was the planned construction of a cable car that will descend from the new city into the old, which will better allow handicapped Jews to make their way to the Western Wall. This innovation, Kimmelman described in the Times as the Disneyfication, Disneyfication of Jerusalem. Then, the following astonishing sentence appeared in the piece, quote, Modern Jerusalem was speared Disneyfication, first by the high-born culture of British colonialism, with its awe for the city's antique past, and next by Jordanian paralysis, which froze the old city as if in amber. So the Times wrote, this could only have been written out of astonishing ignorance or deliberate dishonesty. The British who banned the most basic of Jewish observances at the Western Wall on Judaism's holiest day, they made manifest an awe for the city's antique past. The Jordanians who between 1948 and 1967 blew up the Churva, one of the most magnificent of Jewish synagogues in the old city, who allowed for the desecration of Jewish graves on the Mount of Olives, where centuries of Jews had traveled to die. The Jordanians froze the old city as if in amber? 
One suspects, therefore, that for the New York Times, the preservation of Jerusalem is entirely consistent with the destruction of its Jewish sanctuaries, the prohibition of its most sacred rituals, the eradication of its Jewish presence. In the end, perhaps what bothers the purveyors of lies such as these is less the Disneyfication of Jerusalem and more the fact that a Jewish Jerusalem risen from the ruins embodies a people, a Jewish people, that, phoenix-like, refuses to die. This is a miracle that raises the uncomfortable possibility that all that the Jews claim about Jerusalem and about the Jews is true. And this is too terrifying for the times, its critics, and its readers. And so it must be fought, not only politically, but with a steady stream of propaganda, Propaganda that is itself an act of historical and intellectual vandalism that seeks to silence the shofar's message from Jerusalem. Today, one cannot read the prophets without thinking of present-day Israel, and one cannot visit present-day Israel without thinking of the prophets. Truly, as Isaiah described, the Lord has made Zion's desert into an Eden, her wilderness into a garden of God. One cannot attend the wedding in Israel without being reminded of Jeremiah's assertion that one day the voice of bride and groom will again be heard in Jerusalem. One cannot exit Yad Vashem and behold Jerusalem rebuilt without thinking of Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And one cannot spend the Sabbath at the Western Wall without thinking of Zechariah's promise of grandparents and grandparents, of grandparents and grandchildren in the streets of Jerusalem. And then too, around the world, there is also a hint, a harbinger, of another prophecy by Isaiah that one day multitudes of non-Jews would seek to praise the God of Israel made manifest in Jerusalem. There is much yet in the biblical vision unfulfilled. The world does not redeem, the wolf does not lie down with the lamb. The current culture of the West, its rapid paganization, has given us real reason to fear for its future. And even in Jerusalem, Jews are allowed to visit but not pray atop the Temple Mount an ongoing contradiction that is a source of great pain to me. But given the wondrous events in Israel and the way that Jerusalem has come to inspire so many millions, we have reason to hope not only that the Jewish relationship with Jerusalem will grow deeper, but also that the very particularism of that miracle will continue the universal inspiration that is Jerusalem throughout the world so that the very Jewish cry sounded through the narrow part of the shofar will be made manifest and stir the souls of biblically loyal people of faith around the globe. And this brings us back to the boy with whom we began, taken prisoner by the British, released upon the de-Judaization of a sacred act in which he had engaged. The book The Western Wall Wars describes how decades after 1946, long after these boys grew into men. Moshe Karavani's partner in crime, Shmua Bahayo, was interviewed by the journalist Chaim Tsur about all that had occurred at the Kotel on Yom Kippur years before. The next day after Shmua Bahayo's interview, Chaim Tsur, on his radio show, interviewed another Israeli, a man by the name of David Ben Kiki, who, having no idea what Tsur had discussed the previous night, told Sur the following story. Traveling in Scotland, Ben Kiki had been approached by a local who asked if he was Israeli. Upon Ben Kiki responding in the affirmative, the Scot described how he had served as a soldier in British Mandate Palestine and had been ordered to patrol the Wailing Wall on Yom Kippur. He told him, quote, I was told that if the horn is blown, the moment it happens, I should catch the people who did it. In fact, he said, the horn was blown here and there we managed to run after some young boy. We caught him and arrested him. We brought him to jail and also to trial, and the horn was presented as evidence. And the Scot then added, I am an honest man, and I didn't know why it was forbidden to blow the horn. But I thought to myself, if this thing is so troublesome to the British Empire, and if Scots don't like the English so much, maybe I'll be able to use it someday. And so, interested in the mysterious power of the chauffeur. The Scot took it back to Scotland with him. The audience, hearing this, was stunned, for they had just heard the night before from one of the boys who had blown the chauffeur. And now they learned that one of those chauffeurs, long ago confiscated by a British soldier, 
was in Scotland, ready to be returned. And so it was, and the chauffeur once sounded in 1946 at the Wailing Wall, now sits on display in the Irgun Museum. The shofar has come home. And thus another sublime symbol, providing a profound and much less painful poetry, concludes the tale of Moshe Caravani and his friends, that a shofar born by foot from Yemen to Jerusalem is returned in respect and awe by a Gentile on the other side of the earth, thereby embodying the very journey of return of the Jews to Jerusalem and the wonder that this event can inspire around the world. Thousands of years ago, the shofar was, was blown in the land of Israel to mark the Jubilee year in fulfillment of the biblical command that would one day also drive the young boys of the Irgun. Ukratem diror ba'aretz l'chol yoshveha. Proclaim liberty throughout the land. This scriptural sentiment expressed by an ancient horn is also emblazoned upon a bell in Philadelphia, reflecting this country's once profound bond with the Bible, a bond that grows ever weaker. But, as Eric put it in his essay, Jerusalem, forever the Jews' city of hope and once again the West's, is now the emblem of our shared purpose, to work with faith, political will, and moral resolve to rescue and defend our shared heritage from destruction and decay. In the face of the many miracles of our age, it is not too much to pray that the chauffeur's cry declaring the message from Jerusalem will inspire the West to embrace that biblical bond once again. Thank you very much.